Welcome to Health Talks. I'm Gail Hogan, and I recently had the pleasure of talking with two Ohio State experts, Dr. Bodo Knudsen and Dr. Ganesh Shittam, to answer some questions about kidney stones. Dr. Shittam, what are kidney stones? Kidney stones are deposits, hard deposits of minerals or chemicals in the urine. They are normally found there, and uh, they affect up to 10% of the American population. And they account about half a million emergency room visits. Um, they are very common, and not only they are very common, but they tend to recur. So are about, they really stones? Yes. So they are stones because they are made up of calcium, phosphate, and sometimes, occasionally, they could be made of uric acid, cysteine, or struvite. So they are minerals, so they are classically stones, but we call them as organic stones, not the stones from the street. <laughs> because if you analyze these stones, they can be completely differentiated. Dr. Knudsen, what does the pain feel like in the beginning so that someone might know that this is developing? So extremely severe uh, is one of the signs. So pain in the side, either on the left or on the right, that's really, really intense, um, can come out of nowhere, uh, is typical of a kidney stone. And then as the stone progresses and moves down closer to the bladder, then sometimes people start to get urinary symptoms where they feel like they have to go more often to the bathroom or they get this pressure to go. Do we know how they form? So lots of different theories. Um, but the basics is that these crystals in the urine are getting too concentrated. And what I like to tell patients, it's um, when you take a glass of water and you put some salt in the water, if you have a lot of water and a little bit of salt, it's easy to dissolve it. But if you have a little bit of water and a lot of salt, it's hard to dissolve. It kind of sticks to the side and forms these crystals. And that's what happens with stones. There's not enough fluid and these crystals stick together and start to form the, the little rocks. Dr. Shittam, how does one person get kidney stones and someone else does not? So um, most of the patients who form stones have some risk factors for forming stones. The risk factors could be as simple as the patient is not drinking enough water so that he is making very little urine, that means very concentrated urine. And when somebody has a very concentrated urine, it can have a high risk for forming stones. Other could be like that the patient is having very high levels of calcium, uric acid, oxalates in the urine, and they can increase the risk factor. There could be a deficiency of inhibitors of stone, like citrate, and that can increase the risk factor. Uh, so there are a number of ways we can identify these risk factors, and that might be responsible for the risk of the stone. Is a risk factor have to do with age, gender, race, any of those things? In general, Stone is seen in young patients, and I would call young as 40 to 60. They are very common. I agree, 40 to 60 is young. <laughs> <laughs> so 40 to 60, but they are present, can, can, they can present throughout the age. It is also remarkable to see that they are most common in uh, white male uh, population. So these are the ones which are, I would say, are the most common. Uh, as regards age and gender. Dr. Knudsen, how do we prevent this? So that's the million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are some basic things. So the first one uh, is hydration. So you really wanna drink a lot of fluids. And the more you drink, the more urine you're gonna make and the more you're gonna dilute out those crystals. And then, you know, the question is, well, how much do you really need to drink? And the way I look at it, it's not so how, how much you drink, but it's how much you urinate or how much you pee after. You want to be making about two liters over 24 hours. And that's a lot if you think about it. If you take a big plastic soda bottle and cut the top off, and I tell you, you got to fill that in 24 hours, that's a lot. Um, but it's important to look at it that way because if I tell you just to drink two liters a day, you might go out on a hot day in August and sweat a liter out and you're only making a liter of urine that way. So you really have to tailor it to, to how much you're going to the bathroom. Well, let's talk about diet then. Anything that we eat would have a good or, or bad effect on whether or not we develop stones. Yeah, it can. Um, so it's interesting. A lot of the things that we think are typically healthy uh, and good 
tends to actually be pretty good for kidney stones. So um, generalizations would be lower salt in the diet, lower sugar in the diet um, are both good for stones. Um, smaller- Good to prevent them. Yeah, good to Not prevent good them. To get them. Yeah, okay. good to prevent them, okay. yeah. Um, smaller uh, portions of meat, so a little bit less animal protein um, can be helpful. Lots of fruits and vegetables in the diet tends to be a good thing. Um, but one exception um, is spinach. So spinach is extremely high in oxalate, kind of off the charts high compared to some other things. So that's one that we usually screen our patients for is how much do they eat? Because some people eat a spinach salad every day for lunch and raw has actually got more oxalate than cooked. So that's one that we try and watch for. Dr. Shidham, will stress contribute to stones in some people? Stress indirectly can contribute to, stone patient, uh, to, to stones. And the reason for that uh, is because patient in stress um, usually may be inclined to eating uh, unhealthy foods, junk foods, may not be drinking fluids, uh, may not be exercising, and these all increase the risk for kidney stones. You mentioned there are some myths regarding kidney stones. Can you share what those are? Number one myth, stones can be dissolved. Uh, I would say very small part is true, but most of that is not true. Uh, the small part is because a uh, very uh, small percent of the patients do form stones, what are called as uric acid stones and cysteine stones. These stones, if they're small enough, they can be treated by medical management. And that's truth. The, the, the wrong goes when the patients have calcium stones. When they have calcium stones, you cannot dissolve them. They have to be either passed or treated or removed or blasted by urology doctors. Myth number two is avoid calcium in your diet because your stone is made up of calcium. And that's perfectly wrong. There are a number of studies which shows that low calcium diet increases the risk of kidney stones. So the recommendation is to um, to, to have a normal calcium in the diet in the form of dairy, not in the form of supplements like tablets, but in the form of dairy products and food which are high in calcium. And the usual dose, usual daily recommended for calcium is 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams depending on the age. Number three, myth number three, Dr. Google knows everyone, <laughs> everything. And it's, um, I see so many patients coming to me and uh, tried everything that internet says and their friends says or somebody says and tried those things and fortunately coming back frustrated and having recurrent stones still. So there's nothing wrong going on internet, studying, looking, educating, but we need to be careful what the limitations are and what they are. So I would suggest uh, to Get in touch with your healthcare before you want to start any recommendations that are, that are online, especially if you want to do it on a long-term basis. Myth number four, cranberry juice helps to prevent stones. On the contrary, studies have shown that cranberry juice increases the risk of kidney stones. So they should be avoided because they have high levels of oxalates and they make urine acidic. So, uh, but it has shown, studies have shown that it prevents urinary tract infections. So it is okay for patients who have recurrent UTIs to have cranberry juice, but not for prevention of stones. Dr. Knudsen, how do we get rid of them? So you have them. Now you have to get rid of them. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why people come to see me. So that's my specialty is taking stones out. Um, the big thing is we've gone from a time where big incisions were made and they were, you know, long recoveries after surgery. And the exciting thing now is everything is done minimally invasively. There's almost no stone we can't get to without some sort of minimally invasive technique. So we kind of say the days of open surgery for kidney stones are, are gone. Um, there's really three main treatment types. Um, the first one, which has been around since the, the late 80s, is shockwave lithotripsy. And it used to be a water bath that people went into, and sound waves or shock waves were um, aimed at the stone through the water bath to hit the stone to break it up. Uh, and the stone would break into smaller pieces that the, the patient would then pass. 
Nowadays, the machines are much simpler. You don't have to go in a water bath anymore. It's just a machine you lie on. Um, but the principles are the same. It really hasn't changed a whole lot. So that's kind of our first option. Um, the second option is um, we go in with a scope and we use a laser to break them up. Um, all of this is done with the patient asleep, of course, in the operating room, so they don't see or feel anything. But the lasers now have become very powerful and can take these big hard stones and disintegrate them into tiny little particles. Obviously, you can get them again because you've said, well, once someone has them and then they can have them sometime in the rest of their life. Do you, can you prevent a second, a third, a fourth? Yes, so you can, um, or you can help reduce the risk. But um, patients ask that, you know, I've had a stone, uh, am I going to get another one? And what I tell them is, if you don't change anything, you probably will. Because whatever factors cause that first stone to form are still likely there. So then it's time to start to focus on making the changes. And, you know, just getting your fluid intake up a little bit, you know, can certainly help with that. Um, the way we approach it is if it's somebody's first stone, they've never had one before, um, you know, we start with the basics, you know, more fluid, look at the overall diet, are there some tweaks we can make, um, you know, were they a big spinach eater, can, right. we, can we cut that back? Um, and then we kind of see how they do, we follow them for a while, and if they don't get another stone for a period of time, then they're hopefully in pretty good shape. However, if it's the person that you're doing that and then they're still forming stones, you know, six months later they're back with another one. They, those are the patients we target for a more kind of sophisticated workup. And what it involves is we have a team of nephrologists who work with us in the stone clinic who are experts on stone prevention and they'll have the patient get um, some 24-hour urine collections where they collect their urine for a couple of days and it gets analyzed specifically for stone risk factors. And the way I look at it, it's sort of like a blueprint to why they're forming stones. And then the nephrologist uses that to kind of navigate their risk factors and start to adjust them, be it with diet, medications, or other things. Dr. Shidham, can you explain then why the experts at Ohio State, your entire department, why you are so important to patients who have kidney stones? This division is nationally recognized for its excellent patient care in kidney care, um, in kidney disease. Our uh, faculty in, this, uh, in, in our division are well recognized and they are experts in various areas of kidney disease. So a patient with kidney disease can get all the care they need under one roof. Nephrology has multiple subspecialty clinics, um, like we have clinics uh, for glomerulonephritis or vasculitis clinic, what we call as. Or we have patients um, with polycystic kidney disease, we have a special clinic for that. We have clinic for hypertension, clinic for uh, metabolic stone clinic. Uh, we have clinic for onconephrology or nephro-oncology, where patients have kidney disease because they are exposed to, kid, uh, to cancer or medications because of cancer. And then we have stones for uh, uh, clinic, clinics for, uh, uh, for transplant, pre and post transplant. And of course we took, take care of patients with dialysis. So we have a whole sort of subspecialities um, uh, and the patient can be taken care of uh, under one roof. Not only that, but nephrology has a robust clinical research program, and the patients have an opportunity to enroll in one of those uh, clinical trials if indicated. Thank you for watching Health Talks.